we, we oftentimes talk about like our marriage is our first ministry, but if, if, but what about even beyond that? Like, how do we minister together in specifically the local context? Them? Yeah. How is like, we're not the end, yeah. but a means to the end, but we can't, we can't reproduce what we don't have. So we got to be healthy. And so we are all for having a healthy marriage, but uh, God blesses us to be a blessing to others. All right, we are, I am here with Angie Lewis, my beautiful wife. Yep. And um, we are excited because we are continuing in the This Is My Boulevard podcast and we're going to be talking about Live Local. What's interesting is that we're starting this podcast at 4.03. So in approximately a minute, 4.04, our alarms are going to go off because that symbolizes that's the zip code or area code, area code the yeah. area code that we are in 404 and every single day we hear it there it is that symbolizes the time that we are going to mine did pray. not work that's the time that we're i wasn't to called to pray yeah but 404 represents the harvest is plentiful the labors are few we need to pray for our community so both here that in the fourth ward neighborhood in which we live and then also in stone mountain and the way the rule is is that whenever we whoever's talking at the time they're the one that's going to pray so we're going to ask you guys to join in with us as we pray for this podcast pray for our city um, our neighborhood specifically and um so let's join in so let's pray father we are thankful for this time thank you for your grace and your mercy lord um, thank you for even this opportunity to come before you and just pray Father, we do pray, Father, for both more labors to be raised up in both the Stone Mountain um, area and then also labors for here at Blueprint Church. Lord, we pray, God, that you would be glorified, God, um, and your church would be edified by raising up labors for the harvest. So, Father, we give this time to you. Um, we give even this podcast to you as we uh, speak on and talk about um, marriage and ministry, specifically uh, living local in a local context and so father to you be the glory in jesus name amen 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 all right so i mean we intentionally and unintentionally kind of did that it was just kind of the time that it was it was like let's just start and let's just kind of kick off the podcast in that way and just talk because that is one of the ways that we live local right uh, we pick in atlanta the 404 time as a reminder of our ministry that we've done and and so that's really what I want to talk about is I want to talk about like ministry and marriage, but this year's theme is like living local. So how do we reject passivity, accept responsibility um, in making disciples where we live, work and worship. And we, we oftentimes talk about like our marriage is our first ministry, but if, if, but what about even beyond that? Like how do we minister together mm -hmm. in specific How did that stop context? there? Yeah. How is like, we're not the end, yeah. but a means to the end, but we can't, we can't re reproduce what we don't have, so we got to be healthy. And so we are all for having a healthy marriage, but uh, God blesses us to be a blessing to others. And so that's why I want to talk about the blessing to others, the living local. And so, and that's one of the aspects is that we pray, uh, not just us, but as a church at that time. But one of the things that we also do, and you know, you specifically more uh, like more so um, do is that for every one of our kids, we have uh you have an alarm that goes off yeah. you know to praying for us and usually if i'm there with you i also pray with you i don't do the same thing because i have too many meetings and it's oftentimes i can't do it i have to yeah. interrupt so many meetings because we got so many children and so many of us so i couldn't <laughs> i couldn't be like all right stop you know mine got and mine went off like three times during church and i was like <laughs> yeah sorry so i took it off a of sunday i was like let me just not do that let's yeah, pray at the beginning yeah on sunday but <laughs> just talk to me why talk to me why because like as we think about our marriage because this is marriage in ministry so our ministry primarily first and foremost is to our the lewis eight our children mm -hmm. and so talk to me a little bit about that you know how does our ministry, ministry to our exists. children and ministry of life exist to our children yeah for me when I think we're ministry, where does my ministry exist? I think, and it, it, this is big picture, because it's obviously not the totality of it, but I think primarily in my home. And what that means is, yes, for my children and everything, but my primary means of getting the gospel out right now is through relationships. I'm making friends with my kids' friends, mm -hmm. you know. Um, 
I'm being a, a value add to them. I'm an, a, a trusted adult in their lives. Um, and, and before we even get to the friends part, I'm just talking about like, you have yeah. made the, the decision to pray six times every single day for our children. So we're gonna get to, while they're not the end, you know, they're, they're yeah. the means, but like you made a decision first to pray for them six times a day. What, what led you to pray for them? Because like with Trinity, she was born on November 29th. So every day at 11, 29, you pray for her. Um, Braden was born at nine, um, on September the 10th. You pray for him, J 12, you know, 12, 12. So it's like, so every single day during the kids' yeah. birthday, you've decided, why did you do that? The, you know, you and I, we've, we've confessed our loyalty to the Lord, but just us being married and us being believers doesn't make our family Christian. Yeah. Like I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, we're a Christian couple, but that doesn't make a, us a Christian family. Like God has to get a hold of each of their hearts, and so if that's true, then I need to make sure that I'm managing that's good. each of their hearts. I'm evangelizing. I'm I'm doing. Obviously, only God can change their hearts, but I'm pouring into. I'm attentive to. I'm becoming a student of my child in this, and and I'm trying to find ways. What are their shortcomings? What are their insecurities? What are the things that I can remind them about the Lord and. Um, you know, things like before basketball games, just, hey, Bree, God is with you when you go down to the depths of shield to, you know, when you're, you know, that verse and song. Like, he's also with you on that basketball court. So when you're feeling that, you know, just using life, the opportunities. And one of the things I don't want to miss is a, is a statement that you just made that we often say we actually teach in class, marriage classes on this, where it talks about, we say two Christians don't make a Christian couple. Right. And so it's sort of like I thought, hey, I'm a Christian. You're a Christian. We come together. We make a Christian couple. But there are certain disciplines that we have to have. Sure. Yeah. Right. In order to make sure that we're putting ourselves because it's sort of like a lot. Oftentimes people in marriage think, hey, you're a believer. I'm a believer. Will you be your believer? I'll be a believer. When we come together, we'll be believers together. But it's in the same way that we have to discipline ourselves in our own Christian walk. Yeah. To create that unity and that identity. Yeah. Yeah. And so in the same way we talk about our marriages, we got to bring those same disciplines to our nuclear family. And this is one of the disciplines. And so talk to me a little bit about why prayer, you know, why <laughs> prayer as one of prayer, things. because I finally figured out that I can't fix this. Like I, I can't institute change, you know, like when they're little, it feels like you can. Yeah. It, hey, smile and say thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. And they do it. And it's like you're just teaching them how to um, like fake their emotions. And when they get. Okay, let's see. One. Okay, that was for Dahati. 411. Um, 411, that's our, our oldest sons. Do you see what I'm saying? How annoying that is. To some it's degree. not but annoying. It's like annoying, but it's also <laughs> like thank you because it's like he's sick right now children. so i'm praying yeah. internally for him for to him. feel yeah. better and not to spread his whatever he's yeah. got to yeah. everybody else he's sick but he you know, he's not sick game. enough he's yeah. going to his basketball game yeah so he's just like i'm sick enough but i'm like everybody i want to be jordan you know it's like i'm gonna go play my sick and i'm gonna play through this flu and yeah. i'm gonna drop 40. You know, and then sleep for the next two days again. Yeah, and then sleep yeah and it'll be too sick to go to school the next two days while there's just practice yeah. But then come back on Friday. He'll be good. Friday. Again. Yeah. So that's how that works. Well, but. In fairness, he, he, yeah, didn't, he didn't yeah, look so hot. But know. anyway, what were we talking about? So we're just talking about like prayer. And I love kind of what you was talking about with prayer. Oh, I gave up. Like I can't do it anymore. Yes, yes we can't. Because, I, I lost the illusion. See, right? here's the thing. This is a reality because we've been teaching on a parenting class to Blueprint uh, tomorrow. And here's what we've come to grips with. No Christian like believers ever writes books about <laughs> parenting teenagers no right and so we're in the teenage no, we heard phase. heard that one did but they were all lies <laughs> yeah yeah we heard that we heard from someone that knew them they're like that's not how it happened <laughs> because what we recognize is that like you said you know we we talk about parenting in phases and when we do a ministry we like from zero to 12 is control from 12 to 18 yeah. is conviction and from 18 on is counsel and so Control phase is the glory years of parenting because oh, you just so tell them what easy. to do and then they just do it. Yes. You're physically exhausted, but hey, you have control. Yeah. 12 to 18, you don't have any control. The friends' voices have become more 
And I, now I know I can't well, parents homeschool their kids. It's like, I can't, I can't compete. <laughs> compete. I cannot compete. Yeah. I, like, I got to be the only voice. But, but 12, 18, you're just praying and hoping, Lord, just let them not kill each other. Let them not do something that's going to change the trajectory of their lives. Mm -hmm. Like, that's, you're just holding on like, as parents. Mm -hmm. You're holding on for dear life. And so that's why we recognize that no parent, like nobody writes books while they're parenting teenagers. And it's either like youth workers write books because they're like the uncles. Yeah. Like they come in and it's like, oh, let me tell you what to do with your yeah. kids. But you ain't got to go home with them jokers, yeah. right? But they're then, on their best behavior. Yeah, right? yeah. You, they're on their best behavior, they got to work. And then you write the teenage books when you're like super old, you forgot. Like right. he's just like, I killed it because they came back. And it turned out all right. Yeah. It turned out all right. So he's just like, okay. Do you remember uh, write a book about it. our old pastor gave that analogy about the kite? Yeah. I thought that was really helpful. He said in the, when they're little, like you just kind of reel out the kite a little bit and you let the, the string go and the kite's just kind of right here flapping around. But as they get older, you let it out further and further. And the goal is to eventually just let go. Like yeah. you're no longer in charge of that kite. But he was like, but there's going to be days that that storm is coming and that kite is going to be flopping all over the place and tearing up and looks like it's going to be destroyed. And he's like, you don't reel it back in. Like you don't try to gain back control. You just hold on. And you just pray. You Trust. just let it do all that slipping around because if you try to will it back in, you're gonna destroy it. And that's what, and that's why we pray. I like we always talk about the difference between felonies and misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. So in the conviction phase, right? Like a felony in the control phase, the first twelve years was don't lie, don't you know that was felony. When you get into the teenage years, you kind of give up on a lot of all that. <laughs> like, don't is, go to jail. Like, yeah, it's literally <laughs> don't. don't cause life altering things. Mm -hmm. That's really that's going to alter your life. We're going to have to give up on all the misdemeanors. We're just joking, guys. Our kids aren't that bad. Oh, well, I mean, no, I'm not joking about the misdemeanors. <laughs> misdemeanors is like, and I literally, and I tell them, it's like, it's like that kind of analogy. My goal is like that you do not do anything that's going to be life altering. Yeah. And then you got to give them that. Like you got to give them room to take misdemeanors, right? And so, and you begin to change because you know, oh, growing up, you're just like, all right, man, we're gonna make sure they don't, that they're not gonna date, they're not gonna like all these things. And he's just like, until they're 16, you have all these great things, and then you're just like, mm -hmm. Lord, just please, just don't keep like them alive. keep them alive. Yeah. Don't get pregnant. Like those are like life altering things. Mm -hmm. And again, you guys are like judging us right now. But <laughs> hey, listen, if you, you're only judging us if you don't have teenagers, right? And if you do have teenagers or have parent teenagers, you, you feel at peace. You have peace because you're just like, thank <laughs> you like, for oh. somebody saying it. Yeah. Because I'm just gonna say it, and I'm just like, mm -hmm. that's it. That's the bottom line. But this is not about parenting teenagers. This is just about <laughs> yeah, the first ministry, it. and this is about the number one ministry that we have is pray and be an yeah. example. And that's why I love what you do, um, you know, is, is the pray. We do it together every night at 922. And that's when I do, we both have our arms set because at 922 is when the Lewis 8 was established and that's our marriage. And so we try to pray for our children, pray for our marriage, pray at 922 every day and all that. But part of it is that we're, we want to have, be a blessing to our, uh, you know, we want to be a blessing to bless our children but ultimately, so that our nuclear family can be a blessing to a world. And it's really hard. And I know we've lamented oftentimes because we've had all these, you know, these grandeurs, like, oh, we're going to be a family, we're going to be on mission together, we're going to do it. And some of you guys have that. So please let us know, write to us, the hadi at my book, blbd.co, about what the techniques are, if you are able to be this. But even as you say that, you, you can't manifest that. That's the heart. That's the uh, Lord's uh, job. That's part of it is I'm just wanting to see people oh. send it to me. You want some encouragement? Yeah. But no, I mean, yeah. it, so, but being a blessing of the, so I, what I did want to talk to us about is part of how we leverage, because we moved into the old fourth ward. Mm -hmm. We moved into a neighborhood that everybody said, do not move into our neighborhood. Yeah. Do not move into this neighborhood. And it was just, it was like one of those things. We lived across the street. And, you know, if you've heard me talk before, we lived across the street that over the course of 10 years, there have been 20 murders, you know, at that park. We mm -hmm. like we moved in, in the heart of all of it. You know, people says you don't sacrifice your kids on ministry. We did. But one of the things that I've always said is that a problem is not a real problem until it's your problem. Yeah. And something becomes your problem through relationship and through proximity. And so we put ourselves in the heart of 
real problems. And we made that real problems in our kids were in schools and we put our kids in public school and all of those things. And so I just really want to talk to a little bit about like why in the world did we go against so much counsel? We also had counsel saying it's a good thing, but why in the world would we go against so much counsel, especially people who live in the city and do ministry in the city that, but they send their kids to private schools and all that, which is also good options, but we decided to do different, right? And we want to live local and be local and be present and say, hey, this is our problem. So let's just first talk about like us making that decision. Yeah. You know, remember the first time? I'm driving up to the driving park. Driving up to the park. Yeah. Yeah. And the kids wouldn't get out of the car. They wouldn't get out of the car. I was like, come on, guys. You're embarrassing me. <laughs> I can't Literally. Out of the car. They're like, no, where's dad? I'm not getting out. I was, like, yeah. I was like, get out of the car. You're making it more awkward. And they would not get out they of the car. They would not get out of the car. Nope. And then I got there. They finally got out of the car because there were people at, across the street. Like, literally. Let me, like, let's just kind of paint the picture. Like, our neighborhood pharmaceutical people, which we love and we've grown and created a relationship, they were across the street for so many years and we lived across the street from them for many years. We still live in the same neighborhood, but we're just down the street now. But they were there so much that if you Google Earth Day they're still there. five years ago, they were there. They're not there anymore. I tried it. Did you? They're not there anymore. Oh. But they were They caught them on a rainy day. Yeah, they caught them. The but it was literally there because they were there so much. And so they, our kids were like, we're not coming. And so we went from there to now they're like, they love the fourth ward. They're talking about moving yeah. back to the fourth ward. They're talking about living in this neighborhood. They couldn't see themselves in any other neighborhood. So that's a big journey, but we put them in there when they were afraid yeah. to get out of the car. Yeah. What were we thinking? I don't know. Right? Because I think there's there's so many things because the Lord didn't have our heart where, they, where he has our heart now. Like mine anyway. I know I was more fearful, like, come on, Dahadi, we, we can move somewhere else. Like we don't have to move here. But I remember that day driving by, it was an empty lot and it had couches in it, it was overgrown and we couldn't afford anything in the neighborhood because even though it was, it was, it's too close to downtown to be affordable. Um, but there was this lot and I, we drove by it and I felt the spirit of God. You know, like there's not too many times that you can say like you feel it. And I was like, oh, can we drive, can we do that again? Can we make that loop again? And I was like, what about, you made the comment. Like, I mean, there's this. And I was like, no, but for real. It was just like, when I said, there's this, it literally, and there's Couches, a, there's, there's a couches store. in a, yeah. And built, but it's like, not just couches. So there are couches that are abandoned that you can tell, but there's literally a building that was burned down. Yeah. And I get, I mean, don't know if it's true or not, but the story is that it used to be a section eight apartment complex, that there was so much gunfire that was going between there was a police shootout. The police shootout and people yeah. that there was so much gunfire going that the building literally caught on fire and like and got, and just, left. And it got left and no one decided to rebuild it. Somehow it got in the hands of a person who was doing ministry. That was the only spot that we could afford in the fourth ward that is in this neighborhood that like again, again, that was right there. And you've seen this neighbor. You've seen it this had park. a yeah. Because like, what's what's the name of that movie? That um, with um, what men think, what men, what a man wants, what. Now, there was a couple of because there've been a couple what's of movies the at, that, that at the movie? park. Oh, I'm talking about the one, the police one when you had right along, right along, yeah, right along. So that was one. So like, you've seen the park that we we're talking. There's about. There's a old funeral home that was boarded up. Yeah. That's now condos, and then there was. All of that. Yeah. So right across it, but here the we are. store that's. We moved here. And one of the, one of the things that we said to our kids and even to the neighborhood, the, the, the approach that we had about people, right? What, what, what are the two things that we told to our kids then yeah. what are, and that we consistently talked to them about? People are people. And everybody has a story. Yes. And dare not judge them until you hear their story. Yes. People are people and everybody has a story. And yeah. I think that was one of the greatest things because even to this day, Mm -hmm. Our kids, we put our kids in the third worst performing elementary school because that's what any respectable parent looks at the schooling yeah. and yeah. What, what's the name of that website? School.com. What is great, great schools. Great schools. Great schools. Everybody does that. And you're not a good parent if you don't do it. So, don't you know, because <laughs> some people are like, I'm just saying that we do it. But ours was it was terrible. Yeah. It was actually the third worst performing school and all that. But we still decided to put our kids in there. And to this day, right, our kids say that is their favorite school that they ever went to. They went to that school was the one of the third worst. They went to the top performing middle school and then high school was by, by second or third, but it is still 
that Hope Hill Elementary. And that's not because we moved. That's that. because of the racial tensions and divides, right. especially in the way this. Yeah, There's so many different just, factors, but I'm saying that the perp, my point is like, yeah. it is the favorite school that they said, but people oftentimes, we avoid that because of greatschools.com, mm -hmm. right? And, and and so I'm not saying ignore that, but there you was know, so much fruit. There was so much us. fruit in it. There was so many times that, one, God had his people at that school. Yes, he did. Like, I can't, I don't even know. I mean, I can sit here and count all the believers that I know that were in the school, but I felt like when we walked in the door, the presence of God was coming with, you know, like through the teachers, through the volunteers, through, you know, and there's so many times that something was happening in the neighborhood and the whole neighborhood, the kids know, yep. you know, and I remember there was an opportunity in first or second grade, one of the little girls and uh, her father was shot the night before and some little boy was making fun of her like he died, he died. And she's like, no, he's still alive when I left you. And so she's freaking out. He, the little boy's just messing with her. And the teacher is like, Dahati, stand up and pray over this classroom. I remember that. I mean, I remember the teacher, and she was the teacher. She's like, charismatic. She charismatic yeah, like just, a wild card, but just was like, boom. she's like, fire me if you want, yeah. but in Jesus' name, you know. I think I was the often time like she was our angel that yeah. was kind of put there because she taught like what four out of our six children, right? Yeah. At some point, yeah. You know, but again, but it, but story after story after story. But they had opportunities that they wouldn't have at another like yes. a well-performing school that people would complain about the Lord's presence being amplified, you know? So much gospel opportunity yeah. that was at, that were able to happen there that was not able to happen in so many other, that would not have been able to happen in so other, so many other places. And it was just like the Lord showed him, I want to talk about one of those opportunities because we said a problem is not a real problem unless it's your problem. Yeah. Right? People are people and everybody has a story and we got a chance to understand people's story and do all of that. The thing that I want to bring out is really you because I was known for so long as Angie's husband. And the reason why is because it was a real problem. We put our kids. Yeah, five in, of them. Yeah, five of them in that local elementary school, mm -hmm. right? And because we put our kids in, we was just like, hey, a problem's not a real problem until it's our problem. And this became a problem, right? Because third worst performance school, all the stuff that was going on, all the mm -hmm. stories that we can say. And so you started volunteering there. Yeah, right. I volunteered there, gosh, so much. And I'm just, I'm like, I'm the person that takes chaos and creates order. Like, I'll create a system, I'll organize that closet. I'm just going to make something better, and I'll just do it every day. So you just start off as... I started doing stuff like that, with and the then... Kids, with kids' classroom, right? Just yeah, our kids', kids classroom, classroom. And then it was like, the lunchroom is insane. Right. Like, women are screaming at these kids, and I'm like, oh, this is not fun at all. Right. And I was like, can I... Can I do something in here? Can I help? Can, <laughs> Can I, I help? So you just started doing that. And yeah. And so I turned on the music. It had like a plan and it started running more, you know, and they were like, do you want a job? <laughs> right. Yeah. No. I mean, it's like, it's, so it's like, I always tell people, I was just like, when I'm, when I'm sharing, you were there so much. It was like, Miss Lewis, you were so helpful. Can we give you a job? And you went from just volunteering in our kids' classroom and lunch, some lunch hours to then becoming the community liaison yeah. or the no the cafeteria lady right that was the first thing that she did yeah that she became the cafeteria woman coordinator I, the coordinator something i forgot what the title and was. then i remember saying angie you got the most strategic job i still know all those kids right? names because of yeah yeah like right. i i literally got to see every child in the school every single day yes it was just like you're the only person in the whole school that gets to see every single kid every single day yeah. right so not only do we live in the neighborhood but you are now there as the cafeteria lady who is now being able to see uh, the the kid every single day and now you're also responsible for bringing in like having other people volunteer mm -hmm. in the cafeteria so you were able to invite other people in find volunteers to to help manage the lunch hour, see every single kid, every single day. <laughs> Y'all don't know it how was, chaotic this yeah, lunch hour was. It, I don't was know crazy. why that was such a big deal, but it, it was, was. But it was amazing. It was chaos. The teachers loved you, the kids loved you. We were able to walk in the neighborhood, kids like, oh, Miss Lewis, Miss Lewis. It was amazing. So much to the point, I don't know, did you do that one year or two years? Uh, I was there six or seven years total, so I don't yeah. know. So let's just say you were there two years. To the point where, as a cafeteria leader there for two years, they then went to you and said, Miss Lewis, you're doing such a good job. Can you become, because it's a Title IX school, can you title become, IX. a Title I school, I'm sorry, Title IX is sports. Um, 
can you become the cafeteria, or not no, the, um, what do they call it? Community. The community liaison. So not, you, it just went, so now you were the person who, when like MailChimp and other people um, would come yeah. into the school. Then I, I started writing grants and getting money. Because one thing we realized, side note, there's four elementary schools in our district and our PTA budget was like $800 for the year. Their PTA budgets were over 100000 Yeah. So what the teachers need is in other schools is supplied by the PTA and the foundations and things like that. In our school, $800 doesn't go very far. So we started seeing that disparity and just like, hmm, I don't want to just do this for my kids' class. I want to do this holistically because it's, you know, I don't want to just hope, you know, that feels selfish. So then we started... You know, we started finding people to adopt grades. Right. And so we started as a thing. So you're the community liaison. We we made sure that we didn't lose that position as the um, as the cafeteria person. We hired another person that was in the church to be the cafeteria person. Then um, we all we started a city group. And then our city group was like, if you're going to be a part of our city group, mm -hmm. you have to be a part of the PTA because of that disparity. And so we went from literally not having any volunteer hours to, I remember at one point I counted, we were either, mm -hmm. we were given over 270 hours every single week to that school, most of which was being paid by the government because they was paying your salary, they was paying other people's salary. There was teachers that now came mm -hmm. to our city group. So we were given over 270 hours every single week. We were paid to be missionaries on that campus, mm -hmm. um, on that school campus. And through volunteers, through PTA, we were adopting multiple classrooms for each grade. And all of that, you became the person of peace. Oftentimes we talk about, we say, yeah. let's not just find the person of peace, right? Let's become the person of peace. And you became the person of peace. And I was like, I was known as your husband. And for, for the years, for multiple years that you were doing, even still today, that there's so many people in the neighborhood who know you, who don't even know of me. That in that kind of thought went from elementary school to middle school, middle school to high school. So you were on school boards to help name the school or keep the name of the school when they converted. All of those things. So there's so much that we can talk about that. But my point is, is that living it local. started in living local, but it started with us to simply loving our kids, thinking intersection, not addition, mm -hmm. doing ministry in our context, and so. Were we better parents or were we missionaries? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. It, it was all of it. Both, right. Yeah. And I think oftentimes as believers, we don't think about that. It's like, as you go, make disciples, mm -hmm. right? Making disciples of your kids. So we were able to engage in our kids life. Yeah. We were able to and we knew what was lives. going on and we knew the environment. We knew like what they were facing every day. Yeah. Made us more aware. Made us more aware. And because a problem is not a real problem unless it's your problem. Mm -hmm. We have had a better school, better elementary school, uh, not just simply because if there's many people that the Lord used, but part of it was us. Part of it was uh, you in a significant way. We are better. We have a better elementary school now because if it went from the third worst to like one of the I top. I have no idea where it is right? now. It's, but it's one of the top. Yeah, it was, you know? And so it's just like, it's a more, it's so many different factors that it has. It is because of the presence of believing presence. But part of it is because we wanted a better school for our kids. Mm -hmm. But it's also part of it is because we were on mission for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think that if so, if so many of us would just embrace this concept of ministry and living local, that we have a ministry to our kids, but if we also have a ministry through, right, family, right? We, mm -hmm. God blesses us to be a blessing to others. And it started with kind of a commitment to do missions and to be missionaries. And so now I really believe that we have such a reputation at, the, at all of the schools that we can get anybody a job, right? In the local elementary, local middle, and the local high, because we, we have kids that went through all the whole system and have graduated kids. And all of our kids, even though people said, don't put your kids on the altar of ministry, every one of our kids thus far, because it's not, we, we got to say this now, <laughs> because that's not going to be the testimony after all six, but every one of our kids thus far has gotten a scholarship, has gotten honors, has gotten all of the things, but we quote unquote sacrifice them. Yeah. But we did not sacrifice them. Yeah. Right? They're we not didn't. subpar in education. They haven't missed out. Right. But in fact, they've probably more prepared for life for sure. 
But in that, we also were able to do ministry. Yeah. We have also seen people come to know Jesus. We all, like you started off with this and said, we, we have a real ministry to people's friends. We've seen kids grow up in the neighborhood, all of that. And all the while we never started, and I'm not against it, but we never started a like a after school program or anything with overhead. We didn't start any of that. We joined the PTA, we joined the things that we're in. Now, there's pros and cons to that because I would say, now there's not as prominent of a ministry presence there because we're not there there are still believers and people doing that and i think that's what having nonprofits and all that yeah, that is it outlives, the, you. Yeah, it outlives you so that's why i'm an advocate i think that's true because well. as the kids got older and they moved to middle school we moved to middle school yeah. and as they moved to high school we moved to high school and you know so yeah and now we're kind of in high school and now we're in the phase of basketball all your friends friends friends, and... friends so it's like we're always present but we so we've constantly maintained that ministry through and to to our to our kids but in, in yeah through our kids and to their friends and their kids and their families right and it's allowed the kids the opportunity like mom would you talk to this friend this is what she's going through yeah and that could be all you know, from finances to yeah i've done a thousand budgets right. Um, even this past Christmas or New Year's, we do New Year's words. Mm -hmm. We have friends over, and which, by the way, is so much better. Your kids act so much nicer to you. It's <laughs> so much better. Because, like, sometimes every time I'll be ready to put that five-fold ministry, those, like, on my kids when we're doing these words. But, you know, they were so much better yeah. because their kids were there. And their no, kids their were, friends are there. Friends, and their friends, friends, friends are like, this is amazing. Yeah. Thank you for doing this with me, Mr. and Mrs. Lewis. Wow, this is great. And our kids are like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Let me stop being a jerk about this. Oh, <laughs> maybe this is great. You just want to strangle your kids sometimes because they don't know. How long is this gonna take? Yeah. yeah. From the time you open, like, all right, you guys, you guys ready? How, how long are we gonna be here? Like, I don't want that to be my first. Like, <laughs> I just said hello, right? I just said, hey, you guys, yeah. bring out your papers, and they're automatically like, you know, the clock is ticking. So we were saying all of this. It, like in the intentionality but we've learned we're learning things in the process but our the point is is that it's both to our kids and through our kids mm -hmm. but it starts with us it's us saying like what does marriage and ministry look like in a local context in a local setting and so we have to do this again i think this is this is good because some of it's therapeutic for me i don't know if it helped anybody <laughs> out there but it's therapeutic for me because i was reminiscing like, like especially as we go to this game tonight i gotta remind myself right of just patience in the Lord. And exactly. presence. People know who you are. People know who I am. That's what Sho was saying before this. He was like, do people know that Heidi's a pastor at these basketball games? <laughs> no. Like, yes oh. and no. Mm. Yes and no. They do know. But also, it's also, but it's so fun because our kids, the basketball team oftentimes comes over to the house and they want my opinion on stuff because they get my opinion when I'm yelling in the game, but then they want my opinion after. And then you get coaches who send you emails <laughs> okay. saying, hey, parents. <laughs> in general parents, parents don't yell because it's confusing the kids and i'm just like hey, you could have just said that to me just talk to me because i know you're talking to me it's okay hey i'm that dad i live vicariously through my kids mm -hmm. in basketball so um I, i'm still growing i'm still being sanctified in that but, it's a slow process <laughs> you know, so it's like, i want to be i want to do ministry more to my kids and through mm -hmm. my kids so i i stopped trying to and so hopefully one day i can do ministry to the coach because he needs ministering too <laughs> amen we amen. love you guys so anyway this is my boulevard podcast um we we want to just talk about like this whole thing for this year is living local and we just want to talk about what is it like to have a marriage and ministry in the local context i know that there's so many things that you may have questions about and challenges which we can get in like to all the challenges we talked about kind of that this time we let's talk again and talk about man there's so many challenges that there have been mm -hmm. to overcome and, and all of that so we have so much more that we can talk about but we just wanted to you know talk about this so thank you angie yeah. so you gotta keep doing it but we love y'all peace <laughs>